Have you ever played a point and click adventure? How about a word search or hunting through a Where's Wally book? These are all precursors to hidden object games, which have become very popular, especially with the rise of mobile gaming. But how did they evolve from books to games? What traits make a hidden object game? Why are they popular? Or why are they disliked? Don't forget to hit like and subscribe for more videos like this. And of course, more OK Gaming. A modern hidden object game usually consists of mystery and puzzle solving, finding certain listed objects within a scene, a gentle, uncomplicated story for a player to follow, and easy to learn mechanics. This premise may sound simple, but that's what makes hidden object games so approachable for many players. Usually a main character is placed in a situation where something or someone is taken from them, resulting in their journey to getting it back or unraveling the mystery behind it all. This leads a player to different areas where they need to find and use items in order to move forward in the story. These items may be sitting out or hidden in scenes among other objects, where a player must complete a list before they can proceed. Other areas may require puzzle solving, such as a jigsaw, completing a mechanism, or even basic math that will then lead to another area. The hidden object scenes are usually a jumble of items on a detailed background. The list is on the bottom and shows players what they need to find. What I like about some of the item descriptions is that they can be vague or really detailed. Sometimes it will ask for a brush, but never specify what kind of brush. So a player will have to use all prior knowledge of what brushes can be in order to find the right one. One game I played asked for nuts, but it didn't let me click on this pile of nuts, rather this pile of nuts. This can be frustrating, but doesn't happen too often for it to be annoying, and it does come off quite amusing to me. The graphics and animations are simplified, but never look unfinished or ugly. Most backgrounds are meticulously designed, with effort put into details and atmosphere. The characters tend to be paper dolls, which change position or pose with a fade to a different model. This doesn't make them badly done or lazy, but it keeps the plain and uncomplicated feel the game has. Sometimes there'll be basic animated cutscenes, which do look a little dated, but they're few and far between. There are always hints available, sometimes with a cooldown or limit in order to prevent players from just breezing through the game. Some also have a click limit during scenes to again prevent a player from randomly clicking and not actually engaging with the game. Though, if you play a hidden object game just to randomly click around or hint your way through things, I think you may have bought the wrong game. The story is never too complicated, with characters having certain traits that a player will remember and not confuse with others. If the game is put down for a period of time, the story can be easily picked up again, and a player doesn't have to remember difficult plots or controls in order to get back into the game. The length of these games are quite short, only a few hours if played from beginning to end, but this isn't the way they're meant to be consumed. Hidden object games are almost designed to be picked up and put down, to be played in small chunks. We've been playing hidden object games longer than we realize. Most games use observation as a fundamental mechanic, such as learning controls or exploring areas to find quests or items. If you've played a Spot the Difference, Word Search, or even Hide and Seek, you've played a hidden object game. 
books like Where's Wally were popular in finding the little red and white clad man amongst crowds of people, ensuring entertainment for as long as you wanted to stare at the pages. In the late 80s, early 90s, when computer games were being more widely developed, point and click adventure games were a common genre for people to spend hours on. Monkey Island, Broken Sword, King's Quest, Gabriel Knight, any and all LucasArts and Sierra games were hugely popular. You were never too far from one of these games if you had a PC, and the draw was strong. The genre is still popular today, with games using classic puzzle solving and controls, or building upon them to modernize a title. The main mechanic in most point-and-click games was to find an object that would help solve a puzzle in some way. Finding an object was just half the fight, though, as a player had to think of ways to implement it, be it logical or fantastical. Some puzzles would make you think out of the box, while some were easy as using a key in a door. This object usage was carried over to hidden object games, but given less of a focus, it was more of an additional trait that accompanied other mechanics in order to mix up the gameplay. The logic behind the use of objects was also made a little more obvious, as to not slow down the game, but not too much that it doesn't offer the player a challenge. The game that's considered the first dedicated hidden object game was Mystery Case Files Huntsville, which was released on PC and Mac in 2005. The gameplay revolved around finding objects from a list in a static scene, which became the main trait the genre would build upon. Many hidden object games started on PC, but with the popularity of the Nintendo DS and mobile gaming, more and more games were being developed for any and all platforms. This popularity made devs want to put more time and money into the design and gameplay aspects in order to provide the best experience for a player. Though many may think the story in a hidden object game is an afterthought, it's actually used as the driving force for the player, creating situations where the main character must push through puzzles to reach the end or come to a satisfying conclusion. The varied themes enable any situation to occur in any universe. Vampires, aliens, ghosts, the lack of boundaries for settings can make every game broad and interesting. The narrative helps create context and helps a player understand the environments they find themselves in, making the strange seem normal. The genre should not be seen as an offshoot of the puzzle or point-and-click games, but one of its own, as they're popular and growing more so, with many titles being developed and published every year. It's been repeated quite a few times that gaming can be really good for cognitive development, critical thinking, hand-eye coordination, among other things. Hidden object games, like brain training games, can help sharpen your mind in a multitude of ways, just by how the game is designed. Playing these games can help develop spatial awareness, improve observation and attention skills, and test memory and recall. They can help sharpen concentration, as a lot of focus has to be given to a search scene in order to find all the items. A player is put into an environment that's safe to explore and test theories by trial and error, while encouraging natural curiosity through solving mysteries. This is important because, like cozy games, in order to feel comfortable with experimenting, we need to know all our other concerns are taken care of, such as safety or knowing consequences. This may seem heavy, but it's how cozy games feel so, well, cozy. If we know we won't get in trouble or suffer punishment of some kind, we'll feel free to try new things out and explore our environments. It also encourages analysis of environments and situations to move forward in the story, developing critical thinking when problem solving. They can also improve the ability to understand correlations between items in certain situations, such as using certain sized keys in certain locks. 
The range of different puzzles to work through, such as math or word puzzles, are usually challenging enough to keep a player engaged, while not feel like they're back in school. Something called heuristics also play a big part in these games. Heuristics in simple terms are experiences we already know the outcome of, so we don't have to put too much brain processing towards thinking about it. Mental shortcuts for quick problem solving. If you see an enemy in game, you know to fight them, even if they don't attack first, because the heuristic has already been made in your brain. In hidden object games, this is used when asking you to find an item on the list, or how to use an item in a logical way. We know what a ball looks like, so we look for a round object. Our brains only have to think about what size or color the ball is. There's also a mindfulness aspect too, with game designer Scott John Siegel saying in an interview with Polygon, I think it speaks volumes to the potential for hidden objects as a genre. By definition, it's a style of gameplay that asks players not to just look at a scene or a place, but to really see it. It feels like a very mindful, meditative sort of play. I've learned through years of therapy about the calming power of observing your surroundings and to notice and describe the things you see. Applying the same idea to virtual spaces can feel centering in that same way, even if you find yourself centered in an entirely different world. Another way this kind of game tests your brain is by implementing inattentional or change blindness, which I also made a video on a while ago. To summarize, your brain can only cope with so much information before it starts blocking stuff out. So by showing a player a mess of items and asking them to look for something specific, it makes their brains have to choose what to focus on. This can lead to situations like this where you'll be hovering close to the item you're looking for, but you'll totally miss it. It's always a fun way to add a little challenge to a game by hiding things in plain sight. And once you finally find the last item on the list that you're missing and it's staring you in the face, it's kind of funny. The Nintendo DS was the perfect place for hidden object games, with a touch screen and the use of a stylus, so many games were released on the console. This added to the shovelware misconception and expectation that the games were not complex or fully developed. This, along with the fact that the main player base was older females, caused hidden object games to be seen in the same way romance novels were, not a serious piece of media. Some games offer continuous gameplay with no limits for hints or time played. This can lead to overplaying, but with the games being so short, it's less likely to be a long-term problem. The move on to mobile gaming added to this idea, with some games being heavily monetized or needing to pay in order to play for longer periods of time. However, the games having a cheap price for admission does make it easier for people to get carried away. Offering microtransactions can also cause problems, as with most games, they can tempt people to spend money in order to play a little longer. There are also some really bad hidden object games, which are just cash grabs and don't have the substance properly made games have, but this can be said of any genre. Hidden object games are still going strong today, with companies such as Artifacts Mundi, Ocean Media, G5 and Big Fish all producing games across multiple platforms. The fact that these games didn't require high-end consoles to run made them very accessible to the casual gamer, as they could play on their phones or standard PCs. A lot of the games are either free or have frequent heavy discounts, making them affordable and available to a broader audience. Because of the slow pace of the games, ability to play on most devices and easy to learn mechanics, hidden object games are approachable for players of any level or experience. The storyline is creative and sometimes over the top in order to keep a player curious to know the ending. But it isn't too complicated that a player needs to keep track of every character and conversation. It's interesting and simple enough to remember what was happening if left for a while. 
These games have the ability to immerse a player in a game and world without the need for high skill levels or complicated controls. This means no matter the gaming experience, anyone can get into these games and either learn new mechanics or build on what they already know. The artwork also sells the world we're placed in, with a lot of work being put in the backgrounds and the design of areas that the players can explore. This can be overlooked as the games themselves are considered very basic, and some people will associate complexity with quality, rather than assess the graphics as a standalone feature. A lot of hidden object game players were those who played point and click games like Myst, but wanted a bite-sized experience rather than long, complex storytelling and keeping track of puzzles and items. The pick-up-and-play aspect also reduces the obligation some people have when wanting to play a game. This casual approach means someone can play for five minutes or an hour and not feel like there's a risk of missing out or they need to put a lot of time aside to play. Overall, hidden object games are a popular genre for good reason. They offer casual gamers an experience that doesn't require too much of their time and effort, while still providing fun and engaging gameplay. The brain side of things sounds too good to be true considering we're playing a game at the end of the day, but that's what makes it so interesting. So the next time you see or play a hidden object game, you'll know there's so much more to them than just a cheaply made time sink. This was fun. Let's do it again sometime. And if you like what you saw, don't forget to subscribe and leave a like down below.